back with another episode of Media Unshackled. We have just finished up the big MJ BizCon series, yeah. but you might actually be seeing this before the MJ BizCon series, depending when our product, our <laughs> whippersnapper crack production team gets it all taken care of. It's Eric Williams behind the scenes. We still need to get you a mic, Eric. Yeah. Got to do that. Uh, so we're back here in Phoenix, and I'm pleased to be joined by the owner of Green Force. Yeah, CEO and founder. CEO and founder of Green Force, which is pretty cool. But we're going to start with the beginning, like we do on Unshackled, and get back into his legacy days, because we have no problem talking about the shit that we used to do ourselves. And you all know my story at Boston University, but let's talk a little bit about you. Cannabis. When did you first get involved and learn about cannabis? Um, yeah, great question. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, team. Thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Ryan Rosenfeld. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Green Force Staffing. Uh, I guess, you know, my cannabis kind of love affair started in probably age 13, 14. I grew up in the Philadelphia area, South Jersey. Okay, Mike, closer? Yeah, just a little. Pull it in. Yeah, pull the mic in, yeah. Um, Dancy Reagan, just say no. Yeah, just, right. Great question. I mean, you know, Kind of athletic background, good grades, uh, stereotype for not a pothead, but definitely was a pothead. But I think, you know, I'm 45, graduated high school in 96. Uh, early high school, we were still getting the sexy Mexi and the Pretendica. I was, you know, having to sort through seeds on the Frisbee. I mean, a little, yeah. little bit of the old school stuff. It wasn't quite lids, but, um, you know, I remember probably sophomore, junior year hearing about Kind Bud and, you know, prices being exponentially amplified. Um, but yeah, I was a consumer from an early age, um, never really affected, you know, obviously like, uh, academically or while you were playing ball and sports, you were a consumer. Yeah. hundred percent. I love that. Yeah. That, that, that is one of the favorite things about uh, cannabis and yeah. how it helps people relax, especially individuals who are high functioning or athletes, but go ahead. Yeah. So, um, you know, from that point definitely was not like, you know, full transparency. Obviously there was a lot of. Uh, still, you know, social stigma. Uh, parents were definitely not enthusiastic about, you know, consumption. Um, yeah, I wound up going to college in New York City, you know, privy to early, you know, great delivery services. Sensi Seeds, getting the, the, you know, the White Rhino, the AK-47, the White Widow, all these, like, Jack Herrer, old school kind of Amsterdam genetics into New York City. So, you know, really getting to kind of explore that side of things. Um, you know, and finally able to kind of like start traveling the country and uh, experiencing some of the underground cannabis culture, you know, through live music, through uh, San Francisco, through Amsterdam, uh, graduate college, move out to. That's all the good stuff you're referring to that's kind of disappearing, <laughs> but, you know, it yeah, is what it is. Yeah, I know. Uh, moved to Portland, Oregon, 2001. Um, you know, and kind of quickly uh, take up uh, cultivation. And did um, they have medical marijuana at that point? Yeah, I think or decrim. O Oregon, uh, I want to say it was, I think it was ninety eight. Yeah, Oregon, was, Arizona, California, we all passed medical, medical initiatives. I think Colorado did as well in late nineties, early two yeah, thousands. Yeah, late nineties, early two thousands. So. Um, pretty, pretty easy. Obviously, you know, I think just the West coast in general has always been kind of a, um, more or less, a, uh, the area of academia when it comes to cannabis. I think, you know, California, obviously everybody knows, you know, LA Humboldt, Southern Oregon, kind of being an extension of that Eugene, uh, large counterculture, you know, population kind of traveling up into Portland where rent was cheap, pounds were expensive. You know, it was really easy for a lot of people to make a living or a secondary source of income um, through some medical gardens. So, um, yeah, early early cultivation was was pretty wild. You know, going um, you know HPSs. You know, learning how to um, learning how to wire. We're, we're recording, Dusty, but join <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, hello, hello. I don't know. We can call it. Uh, so. Yeah, just, you know, through, you know, kind of exposure to the, the culture in Portland, you know, neighbors, elders, you know, the ins and outs of old school cultivation and what those techniques like uh, were and kind of, you know, old school, how it was passed down, kind of like by, by the elders or by friends in the know. 
Um, was your first grow like uh, in a closet or was it a greenhouse? I mean, I, or had was a, a little bit? Yeah, I had a grow in uh, Upper West Side of Manhattan in a closet, not not with like an HPS. Oh, in the 90s. Or, this was in the 90s. Yeah. And then in the early 2000s, I made the mistake of starting in my attic initially. Um, you know, learned how to wire some 240, had a couple, you know, thousand watts. Um, ran with some arrow, old school arrow, ran with some soil. You know, wound up settling, you know, thanks to uh, THC Farmer on some uh, recirculating deep water culture buckets, uh, current culture for a number of years. And right. Eventually moved that down into the basement and uh, ran that for, you know, decade plus. Um, so, you know, it was, it was great exposure. A lot of friends in the industry, a lot of like yeah. shared knowledge, shared genetics, shared pests. Um, all the all the good and bad that comes with it, um, but yeah, it was great, and I think it was it was you know a pretty friendly um, you know industry and environment and community, uh, and you know I had a lot of friends. I had, I was a I was a career individual. I, it was never a full time job for me. It was it was always a kind of a hobby. What were you doing for like uh, real work? I, yeah, um, corporate sales. Corporate uh, sales. Yeah, high end lab equipment. Um, Medical device and diagnostics for about eight years. Uh, healthcare worked at Kaiser Permanente yeah. for three years, um, and then you know it was in all the boring stuff. Yeah, all the boring stuff. <laughs> Let's go back to the grow. Yeah, and then yeah, a lot of and then that yeah you know, pivoted into uh, Green Force in like 2015, 2016. But so um, did. Uh Okay, so you did corporate sales yeah. until 2015. Then yeah. you said, I love cannabis so much. It's evolving. Right. How I did mean, that happen? Yeah, great question. I was, you know, I was between jobs. I was about to go work for uh, United Healthcare uh, selling insurance, um, being, you know, being on the carrier side. Um, Oregon had just passed, you know, adult use. Uh, and, you know, I was looking at opportunities in the space. Oregon was the third state. Uh, it was Colorado, Washington, Oregon, as far as, you know, adult use legalization. So looking at kind of like what was out there, Oregon was also, it was That's true. It, it was, was a third yeah, it, was, it was a free market. There was, it was, there was, it was uncapped licenses. Yes, yeah, an open market. Open market. Right. So we had cultivation, retail, uh, distribution, um, yeah, processing, Lab and then there transportation, was transportation distribution. No distribution. Yeah, Tr uh, transportation. There wasn't like a specific license for it. It was allowed as long as it was like license to license. And then there was one research license. So, you know, I think looking at the landscape and trying to kind of forecast what it was going to look like, since there was such a prolific uh, legacy market, right, and a pretty low barrier of entry from an economic standpoint, right. You know, there or was, a government regulation standpoint. Yeah, there we was uh, at the high point, I think, two thousand cultivation licenses. Yes, um, which is know, in, in our meta unshackled yeah. philosophical yeah. outlook, two thousand too few. Right, and you know, you're you know, Oregon is a state of <laughs> we're very much free market guys here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's you know, it's great. Everybody has a seat at the table, but you know, it's you got to compete with. You know, the deep pockets, and you got to put out a great product. Well, um, you got to do that no matter what. You do have to do that no matter what. And you what. can either do that with or without the government's permission. That's true. So, yeah, you, I mean, so there was, um, you know, looking at that landscape, knowing that, you know, it's probably close to seven figures to build out a large scale cultivation facility, you know, not wanting to go into debt or raise money or really partnership. Uh, we looked at you know the ancillary space, mm -hmm. and uh, having helped friends you know navigate some larger warehouse cultivation facilities, you know there is always this component of labor, you know getting people to show up, timing it, scheduling it, you know you got to har you got to plant it, you got to leaf it, you got to harvest it, uh, you're bucking, trimming, weighing, getting it out the door, um, you know, and there is just a good kind of gap there and i knew that that space would be i thought i thought it would be pretty ripe for the industry with how the agricultural like uh, nature of the cycles of it mm -hmm. uh, you know the ramp up the ramp down and there's being downtime so that coupled with the fact that you know it now being an over a regulated market from an under regulated market to an over you know, to a regulated market some might say over regulated there was a lot more hoops to jump through 
you right. know, worker permits. So in Oregon, it's the OLCC worker permit. And what do they call it? They call it a worker permit over there? It's the OLCC um, marijuana workers permit. And we have FA cards yeah, in Arizona. Exactly. So it's, it's, com it's in comparison to that. It's much easier to obtain, uh, cheaper, and it lasts longer. So FA cards are, I think, two years for around three hundred dollars. That you know, that was uh, what the the evolution from the um, what was the uh, DA card. DA cards, yeah, which had to be static to the individual locations. The FA card opened it up to be kind of like free agent between the yeah. facilities, and that's actually why Green Force is able to to operate in Arizona, but. Um, yeah, so our goal was kind of, you know, twofold to, you know, one, um, provide these businesses entering the, the regulated space with compliant labor on demand, right? You need trimmers, you need harvesters, you need people putting, filling carts, putting labels on stuff, stickers on bags, you know, whatever. You could call Green Force, you could get a compliant W-2 employee for a day, you get them for a week, you can get them for a month. We do all the scheduling, we deal with work comp, uh, payroll, and you know you just kind of request the labor. So that was kind of the one side of it. The second side was providing a, a compliant kind of springboard for people looking to get into the industry that didn't have experience, that came from states without you know a medical or an adult use program that were looking to get you know real world experience in the cannabis industry. So it started in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So and now you're in Arizona. Correct. When, when did you move to Arizona? Yeah. So um, now how many other states are you in? Just just those two right now. So okay. we're, we're 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 looking to expand. We looked at Nevada in 2019. Um, pandemic definitely slowed some things down. Right. Uh, it was like fall of 2019. Um, I was looking at states. I was you know recommended by a friend to check out you know Arizona. Um, uh, and you know, first event I ever attended was a, a Wednesday night meet event at the at the Foundry. How'd that go? It was fun. <laughs> it was, was fun. I went from you know a summer. It was June, so it was hot. Uh, I think Oregon was still locked down, and I walked into a meet event, and there was a room full of four or five hundred people, shaking hands, smoking weed, having fun. So it was like entering a, a new world. So it was a really, really positive. Uh, I think we came back in March of 2021. Yeah. Full force. Yeah. Or 2020, April of 2021. Those two months were huge for us. Yeah. So we, you know, started kind of poking around, um, you know, met, met the meetup crew um, and just kind of started laying the groundwork on what it would be. I was just kind of myself with some administrative health back in Oregon um, we officially launched in 2022 and then 2023 is where we've really picked up uh, momentum and, you know, some good partnerships and you know, kind of looking to expand there. So, so what other states are you looking at next or is it a yeah, master Oregon and Arizona before yeah, we move I on mean, or what do you, right. That's the million dollar question. I mean, um, you know, I think they're, I'm originally from the East Coast. I'd love to eventually get back to you know Jersey or New York to have some business opportunities to go see family and friends. Um, obviously, there's some economic windfall there as well. Um, I think you know we need to probably prove that we can you know con continue to expand as a multi-state operator. Um, I think you know our our team here is super solid. Uh, they've done a great job. I think we could probably pretty easily expand maybe into New Mexico and just do like a, a kind of not like a full ramp, you know, build up. Arizona definitely took a little bit longer than than I'd hoped just due to my um, you know, parenting and work and life schedule. Um, I think now with a little bit more resources, we could launch things a little bit quicker. I would like to see us get to, you know, five, six states in the next two years um, and then, you know, figure out what what those are going to be. I think New Mexico is interesting. Ohio is interesting. Missouri is interesting. I'm unsure about what's going on in Minnesota. You know, the states that are already established have longer kind of tenure as far as like adult use. Um, I think a lot of those relationships, the labor relationships are already emerged. Um, not that we can't go add value there, but I think we could um, really benefit some of these freshly online kind of states with just a different scenario for labor management. So you, you most you work mostly with uh, owners and HR 
directors? Great question. I mean, it's all across the board. You know, sometimes it's cultivation team. Sometimes it's HR. Sometimes it's packaging team. Um, it really depends on on the client and you know what the the scope is. Some people think that we just do this, but we can. We're we're not chameleon like, but we can really kind of customize. So, who uh, should be reaching out to you? Like, what uh, kind of enterprises? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, anybody who who requires you know an FA card holder in their facility that you know needs help with a short term project or is having uh, problematic challenges with you know the hiring cycle. It's taking too long. There's too much turnover. You know, we offer, you know, a third party solution to help be, a, you know, a compliant partner in, in labor solutions. So, you know, we can kind of come in short term. We could come do a blitz for a week. We could be long term. We could just be on call. We, you know, we can be kind of like on the side in case things get a little little crunchy and you just need support for an extra week. The beauty of our model is you can kind of turn it on and off like a light switch. Um, you know, and if you find an employee that you like, you can always you know, transition them to a full-time employee of your own. You can buy out their contract. and uh, You should make sure you email anyone who's involved in legalization at the federal level or any congressman or senator who's involved in any, writing any of those bills to make sure they put in a provision in there that says uh, any employee, uh, the certification cards from one state shall be valid to the next. That's that's a great, that's a that, great that idea. That would be a very helpful yeah. thing for humanity. We're all about helping humanity, right, Eric? We are. <laughs> no, but think about that. Yeah. You know, because somebody's just not going to think about that. Right. And we might end up with a problem if they just say states' rights. Yeah. You know? And I mean, and it's, you know, you're. It'd be like the fucking bar. Right. You know, where, where, for sure. where people with certain interests will be trying to, you know, make it more difficult for employees to move fluidly. Right. And you're also, you know, you're, you know, there's, there's the term like food desert or, you know, and it's like you're going to these states now that have been like, cannabis deserts like there's not been you know real legalization or real cultivation and there's so not only is you know obviously like the the, the consultants and you know the the mso's are coming in there with their kind of game plan but you don't have an experienced workforce you know, right you're having to kind of like train them so like a, a migration of labor from we the got west coast to you know going east or north or south or international wherever there's right. you know trying to kind of create a a um a workforce That's to right. support this, this free industry. movement of labor, yeah. meet unshackled, teaching the UFCW and the Teamsters <laughs> how to be better members of the UFCW and the Teamsters, how to be strategic thinkers. Imagine that. Sorry, yeah. I have a yeah. big knock on them because they, yeah, uh, I was talking to the head of the UFCW National. I'm like, how, how could you guys ever support licensing caps? Yeah. That creates like a hierarchy where yeah. labor and employees can learn what's happening in their organization, the enterprise they work in acquire the knowledge, but then they have to get to a, through a government barrier uh, to entry in order to be part of the capital class. I was like, you're, if you support licensing caps, you're dooming your labor and your employees to uh, subservient roles for the rest of their lives. And they looked at me with like a blank stare. The UFCW National looked at me with like a blank stare. I was like, I'm sorry, but this is true. Yeah. And this is true too. Now, if UFCW or Teamsters gets a copy of this, you can take the idea. You don't have to say it's me, but get up to your friends in Washington, D.C., and make sure that congressmen and senators understand that the free movement of labor is important to cannabis employees as well. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't I don't no. mean to. No, I mean, I think it's, you know, as these states come online. The... I come up with these things. This is why I do this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you need to, you know as well as anybody to be successful in this space. You need to be a great operator. You need to have good people. You need to put out quality products. You need to kind of check every box. And it's it's hard to do with a inexperienced or new workforce. Obviously, we can train and kind of groom them to get there. But you know, there is there is a, you know I think a distinct advantage to that labor movement that you speak of. And you have a really good uh, good database of, of labor now. You have a good database of people that you work with. Yeah, we, we do in, in both states, obviously looking to always you know, grow it. And then we also have a database of you know, past applicants, of you know, past employees, skill sets. Um, so it's, it's, it's good. You know, we, can, we can kind of you know, fill a variety of roles uh, and, and be just you know, a partner of the industry. We're just, you know, we, we're obviously advocates of cannabis. We're advocates of the industry. Uh, we want to see success. We want to see 
success nationwide. We want to see um, quality products, people doing it the right way. Uh, you know, low removing the barriers, right? I bar barriers and uh, well, barriers, rules, regulations, yeah. anything that holds back the human spirit to me is detrimental to our existence. So, hundred percent. You know, and and uh, I mean that labor thing is actually kind of quite. Uh, complicated because I'm always thinking, what would the greedy capitalists say? And they might actually like the barriers, um, <laughs> but but then then they also might not. You know, they might like, hey, I want to get my cheap labor from wherever I can, and then right. then you have labor who yeah. says, well, we want to be able to move freely, and then you have other members of labor right. who say, well, we want to be able to protect what we have, True. and if we want to charge more because there's certain unions right. in this state, you yeah. know, et cetera. It's complicated. It issue. is complicated. It's a very it's complicated a series issue. of competing interests. Right. And yeah, we kind of, and we get to, you know, play Switzerland more or less. I, I guess if, if God and mother nature didn't want it to be competitive, they would have made chickens everywhere. So we could just go outside, hunt one, grab it, cut its head off, put it in a pot and easily cook it anytime we wanted to. But there's only a certain number of chickens on earth. It's true. Sorry. I, I, I get into these weird it's, tangents. Sorry yes, about that. It's all good. Um, so I, I like what you're doing, and you know uh, I, we have a, a motto here. Well, it's not we, we copied the one. Remember that everybody works on Monday. Remember that? <laughs> what is that? From? That's from that's from uh, the American president or Dave. Uh, Dave, one of, like a uh, who was that? Was that Kevin Klein? Yeah, Kevin Klein. He's a staffing guy, and he gets yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, you're oh, like right. and you kind of look like Kevin Klein with the mustache, little fish called Wanda vibes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but, but you know, it's a very important it's thing helping very, people very. Uh, find their hopes and dreams, if not just yeah. a place to work for the day. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know, there's a lot of experience. You know, everybody's into experiences now, right? Over like material items. You know, how do, how do you learn most about the industry? How do you jump in and you know get your feet wet roll your sleeves up um you know i think there's a lot of misnomers to it i think there's some stigma the stigma is obviously dissolving but people think it's going to be easy i mean it's it's farming you know it's 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 hard work you know the the you know cultivation everybody wants to get in the garden until they realize it's a lot of cleaning you know it's like brewing beer it's like you don't it's not just sitting around drinking it just like it's not sitting around smoking it yeah, I'm just thinking about the important. I mean, the, the chain of life and the chain of the of the human experience. Everybody has to start working somewhere. For sure. You know, and uh, it's like from dawn to dusk or yeah. from birth to death. Yeah. Everything in between is important. For, yeah. It's just very very it, reflective sitting here talking to you. It's about the it's about <laughs> the journey sometimes, not the destination. Right? Um, excellent. So w what uh, I imagine there's some choices out there in the marketplace as to who people can look to yeah. for their staffing needs. Um, what would you say makes you guys a little bit different? Yeah, um, except for the fact that just for the legacy turning into a, a legitimate ancillary business has my endorsement. It's not somebody from the widget world coming to be more widgety. So I, you have my support in that capacity yeah, thank wholeheartedly. You much. Thank you. Uh, you know what makes us different? I mean, you know, I've. I know this. I know the struggles of you know operation. I know the struggles of cultivation. I also know the reward of doing it well. So I, I, I'm a team player. Team's a team player. We want to be. We want to partner. We want to win. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're responsive. Uh, we we do what we say we're going to do. And you know, if we fuck up, we we own up, and we'll make it right. Um, you know, there are no problems, as they say. There's only solutions. So, uh, we, you know, we've we've got a great team here. Um, you know, we're looking to continue to add staff. We're looking to continue to add partners. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense in this economic environment to be really strategic with your labor. Mm -hmm. Payroll is a very big expense uh, to the bottom line of all businesses, and you know, knowing that you don't have to, you know, have that payroll as always be static, having some options, some cost effective options to come in and you know, mitigate that while not like overworking or overstressing your team or being able to blast out a new product for, you know, a launch. I think there's some some power and some value in that. So you can actually sit down with an entity or an enterprise that isn't using a staffing company right now Correct. and explain to them how they can save money or where they might be able to save money. Yeah. Or just give them an, an an option, another yeah. solution, right? It, it's not, it's not all black and white. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways there, or, you know, these, these also are team environments, you know, camaraderie and uh, rapport and 
attitude and vibe is, you know, it's like any you know, basketball team, the Suns, let's not talk about the Blazers right now, but you know, you, you have a good teammate, you know, this using somebody like green force or staffing in general, not here to just promote myself, um, is, you know, you get to see what that person works like with your crew. Right. Before you bring them on. So it's like, you know, if you've ever bought a car, have you just bought it without a test drive? Uh, sure. Yeah. I got your point. <laughs> 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 but a real quick question though, because yeah. so if I own dispensary, mm -hmm. cultivation, enterprise, anything, mm -hmm. and I, I could sit with you and and you could tell me like uh, what other people are doing, like so like a consulting service. You kind of offer that too, and and advise me on ways that I can decrease my payroll and adjust my labor needs, my labor. You must see so much of that. Sure, yeah. That you could advise. Yeah, is that? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a, it's I mean, a separate business model. But. I mean, it, it is. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've not monetized it, so uh, take advantage of that added value while it's still here. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think. businesses too. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of analytics, right? And yeah. it, we're, you know, we're working with a, a living, you know, organism that's not always on cycle. We're not producing widgets. You know, there's there's just needs that come up due to sometimes uh, good good changes and sometimes bad changes. And there's also just you know sometimes pivot in the market where you're trying to, you know, go get your product with a brand ambassador in almost every door in the state. And like, how do you do that without like some big ramp up promotion? It's probably through some sort of like labor partnership. People so. are not widgets. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, hey, real quickly, so uh, should labor and employees reach out to you too to be in your pool? And along those lines, like you work with, you know, from a bud tender, we say from a bud tender with a mm -hmm. dream to an owner with an exit strategy. Yeah. But I guess that would be from a bud tender with a dream to a CEO who's trying to figure out who he's working for. I guess there's a whole there's spectrum. A, yeah. Who do you? Who do you deal with on that level? I know you work with the entities, the enterprises yeah. who employ all these people. Yeah, right. But how does that feed into your system? Great question. I mean, you know, the labor that's that's requested is, you know, I'd say bulk of it is a lot of production labor, cultivation, packaging, pre-roll, um, extracts, edibles. You know, uh, and it's it's typically the the lower entry level to mid tier level. Um, if anybody's looking for, for employment, you can go to the website, you can go to indeed. Um, we usually have a, some sort of presence at a meet a table. Um, you know, we can you get you an interview and get you in the system. And if it's a fit, great. If it's not no big deal. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's good for somebody who's looking, I'd say here's one of the benefits is, you know, say you're classically, you're, you want to be a chef and you want to go train and learn how to cook everything. You know, you can go to this restaurant, but you're probably going to be there for six, 12 months. You know, you come work for Green Forest, you could theoretically work six, seven, eight different facilities and look at all the different cultivation techniques, look at all the different extraction techniques. Mm -hmm. So like you get that. a little bit more uh, of exposure to some of that. You know, I always try and tell people, you know, job interviews are like, it's a two, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And it's like, okay, when you're in these facilities, you want to see, do they do a good job? They treat their employees well? Are they organized? Is it sanitary? Like, is this a place you want to go work? And right? then you take all that knowledge and you run right into licensing caps. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. Uh, that's my position. Um, but, uh, okay, so... L L I, had, I had a closing question. I was going to ask you, um, uh, is there anything else about Green Force that I, that I have missed that you want to get out there to the community? No. Uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, no. I mean, just first off, thanks for having us on. Thanks for thanks for what you do for the industry. Uh, thank you for the exposure. You know, we're just we just want to introduce ourselves, let people know that there is a solution you know, out there. I think it's you know it's hard sometimes. It, it, cannabis is one of those industries where once somebody vets, vets you or vouches for you, doors start to open. Um, we've been lucky. We've had some great partners here that some doors have opened. Um, always happy to give referrals. But, you know, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, just want to grab a bite, coffee, beer. I'm, you know, I, I'm here to uh, add value to both, you know, the industry and Arizona as a whole. So thank, no. thank you very much. Excellent. I can tell the amount of knowledge that you've acquired from your early 2000, 20 some odd years in cannabis cultivation, cannabis 
employment, cannabis labor, the cannabis industry, you're definitely a, a valuable guy to know if I had a labor pool. Uh, I guess we have Eric, but you know, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. If we, I mean, we would, uh, we would utilize you, but, uh, but anyway, so we're, yeah. let's leave that alone. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so how do people get in touch with you? And yeah. uh, we will see you at Mita for sure. Yeah, uh, greenforcestaffing.com, greenforceaz.com. Um, it's probably the best place to find us from there. We've got a job board. You can search for us on Indeed, you know, probably on Instagram. Presence probably needs a little bit of a, a pump up. But um, yeah, we'll be at any of the media events. Looking forward to the golf tournament. Um, probably dating this podcast or the recording, but... Mm, yeah, this will go out next week. Golf tournaments, two days. Yeah. It's, okay. It's mid December. All right. Well, thank you for thank yeah, you for joining so us. Thanks, and uh, website is again. Yeah. Greenforcestaffing.com. Staffing.com. Yep. All right. We'll be back next show with another episode of Meet on Shackle. Cheers.